Uh, today we will um, go to the second part of um, um, Aristotle, his ethics and also a little bit about his politics. Why do we care about Aristotle? Well, like I said uh, before, again, this um, fresco from Sistine Chapel gives us good idea. Um, if you look at it, Aristotle and Plato are two chief figures in Western philosophy, and not just in Western philosophy. Um, if you read the chapter in the book, and I hope you did, uh, you did already get some information about Aristotle, including how foundational he is for the sciences. From my um, video, actually, previous video, you probably didn't get as much of an idea, because I, what I talked about is mainly his metaphysics. Um, and it may seem that he is also, um, in that sense, closer to Plato, but uh, his metaphysics, he is only a small part of um, his heritage, and among other things, he developed logic, which is something we study today. If you take Philosophy 102, that's almost uh, completely based on the works of Aristotle. Of course, they've been developed um, by different philosophers throughout all these thousands of years which passed since then, but nonetheless it is the foundation of logic and a lot of it is still very very close to the way he um, wrote it. Okay, so a few facts about Aristotle himself. Um, I did start the video from that, but since not everyone watches the video I think that is kind of good to went you with him. Again, he is a student of Plato. He was born in um, 384, which is, remember, we are kind of counting backwards, so that's about 15 years after the execution of Socrates, so he never met Socrates, but he did, of course, meet a number of people who knew Socrates, and um, at the age of 18, he did um, come to Athens from his hometown of Stagria, Macedonia, which is, back then it was again part of this larger Greek world, although uh, Macedonia is generally considered somewhat different from Athens, and for this reason he was always considered kind of a, a foreigner in Athens, he never even had the full citizen status. But nonetheless he moved there when he was 18 to study at Plato's Academy. He became a student of Plato, studied with Plato until 348, so for about 20 years, most of his uh, life at that point. And then after the death of Plato, he probably expected to become head of the academy, um, but for whatever reason, it wasn't him, it was um, Plato's nephew who became um, the head. Aristotle left Athens after that, he uh, did some marine biology research, he was interested in um, marine biology and sciences. And then he became a tutor to Alexander the Great. Young Alexander the Great, 13-year-old Alexander the Great, his father invited Aristotle to actually tutor him. So how, what kind of effect it had on Alexander the Great, we do not know. There is not very much information about what did he learn, what did Aristotle teach him. But, um, well, we do know that Alexander the Great became um, a very good conqueror. He has, um, when he's gone all the way to India, he conquered huge territory, created this um, huge Macedonian empire. So, definitely an interesting person. Uh, then, in 335, Aristotle returned to Athens and found his own school, Lyceum, which is why we again use the word Lyceum today, you can hear it now and then, people say, oh, he went to Lyceum, or this is a Lyceum, so that's basically why they are using this term, it started from Aristotle and his school. Um, eventually, though, um, after the death of Alexander the Great, there was kind of an anti-Macedonian sentiment in Athens. Uh, Greek people felt that Macedonians were in charge for too long and um, 
try to uh, get rid of them and they still looked again at Aristotle as a Macedonian. He was kind of considered a foreigner himself. For this reason he had to run away. Um, supposedly he said that um, he did not want the Athenians to sin against philosophy for the second time. First time of course being um, Socrates. They executed Socrates so he did not want them to execute him as well. Uh, however Despite the fact that he escaped um, that fate, he did not escape uh, natural death. And one year later, he died of natural causes. So that is considered the end of the classical Greek era, the death of Alexander the Great and the death of um, Aristotle, which followed just one year later, basically. That is um, how it ended. He was 62 years old when he died. Not really that old, but uh, I guess not very young either. Okay, um, so let's just go over a few things from the previous lecture and uh, refresh you and give you a chance for extra credit if you did watch it. And also again, that's for the exam, which by the way is getting closer and closer. Remember, it's on March 1st, so we are what? two weeks away, less than two weeks away. Okay, so um, the first question. What did Aristotle believe to be the only things that have an independent existence? Do not confuse him with Plato. Plato thought that um, the forms is the only real thing. They had the only real existence, but that's why Aristotle is not pointing up towards the forms. That is why he's pointing down. Well, nature, what is nature? No, there is a more um, simple answer, and if you did watch the video, you should know that. Of course, if you didn't, like I said, the book is not helpful on some of these questions. Some of them you can only get from the lectures, which is why you should watch them. The book uh, homework is uh, very close to the book. But the exam will be based on the lectures. Okay, so um, it is substances. Substance is a combination of form and matter. So let me actually do it on the board again. Oh, that's okay. So substance. What is substance? I explain it better in the video. Nonetheless. Just briefly, substance is a combination of both form and matter. And form for Aristotle is not the same as form for Plato. For Aristotle, the form is not some sort of outside reality. The form is in any object you look at. So essentially, the good example, uh, which again I do given the lecture is a uh, statue. What is a matter of statue? That would be whatever material it's made of. For example, um, bronze. What is the form of the statue? Well, it actually is the form of the statue, right? So um, that is very important part of Aristotle's um, physics and metaphysics. And like I also said there, and it may be useful for you guys, uh, to note, when we do talk about um, Thomas Aquinas and his uh, proofs of the existence of God, this stuff is important because that's actually how what he uses to prove the existence of God. Okay, let's uh, go to the second question. What does substance consist of, according to Aristotle? Well, I guess I already answered that. <laughs> yeah, form and matter. That is the correct answer. This is two parts of the substance. Um, form and matter. Yeah, that's correct, but like I said, I just explained it 10 seconds ago, so <laughs> I guess it's a little too easy for extra credit. Okay, uh, what part of substance is associated with potentiality? Yes, okay, good job. Now that is definitely worth of extra credit. So, uh, form is associated with actuality and matter with potentiality because bronze is potentially anything. It's potentially a statue, it's potentially 
a sword, it's potentially all sorts of things. But when it has a particular form, that when it actually becomes a statue. Okay, um, what is the cause of the movement in the universe? And move mover, yeah, that's much better. Good, uh, so extra credit goes to uh, Melissa. Yes, the unmoved mover. And note that it's not exactly like the Christian God for him. Unmoved mover is just some sort of rational principle. Um, it is something towards which everything kind of strives. But he is unmoved himself. He doesn't do anything. He does not cause the world to turn. He does not cause the world. He never created the world. It's not even he. <laughs> it's neither is she. It's not um, the human-like figure. It is some sort of abstraction. But nonetheless, Aristotle thought that there should be some sort of God, because that's what causes all the change, right? Why does the change happen? And again, let me explain it one more time, just in case if you guys did not watch the video, uh, even though it is there in more detail. So the world develops in time, right? So we can look at it kind of like this. Maybe we are around here. Um, this is somewhere in the past and it goes infinitely into the past but it's moving somewhere right things change all the time years go by this is the year 2021 but there were years 1900 and 1000 and so on and there are years in the future hopefully um <laughs> we're still moving somewhere so why why does this all happen so there is this idea of an unmoved mover which is kind of like god and everything strives towards um, him or her. Again, you can't really think of it as him or her, but it's probably the easiest way to uh, refer to um, unmoved mover. Okay, why, how? He's not doing anything, or she, or whatever, uh, but is just there. However, the way we um, kind of strive towards the unmoved mover is the same way as if you love somebody, how do you change? How does that change you? You want to look better. You want to impress the person you love, right? So even though that person may not even know about your love, it changes you. So in a similar way, the unmoved mover is kind of there and we are striving towards him and trying to perfect ourselves and become more perfect so that we could become as close to unmoved mover as possible. Human beings more rationally and um, kind of they know what they're doing but um, everything else does that too. Uh, nature itself strives towards unmoved mover. This is his metaphysics. This is kind of a, more of a um, abstract matters which he wrote about and the word metaphysics again in philosophy is because of uh, the name of his book which he himself never gave that name but it was given a couple of uh, three about 300 years later by one of the people who was kind of sorting out his um, writings and at that point um, that person um, decided that since it goes after physics it's natural to call it the one after the physics and the one after the physics in Greek is metaphysics so that's why we're using this word but the substance uh, on which the book is written is kind of like this um, ultimate being matters matters of ultimate reality which is why now we say in Philosophy, whatever part of philosophy deals with this type of ultimate reality, is called metaphysics. Okay, um, finally, what purpose, according to Aristotle, intuition serves? I think I did not elaborate enough in the video, too, so maybe I can briefly do it right now. So, the two key words for that are... Um, 
Well, kind of, yeah, but the better, the better words to use um, universal in particular. It is, universal is generally uh, forms, but um, it's better to use the word universals. What are universal forms? Because actually he talks about two different types of forms too. Um, you don't necessarily have to know that, but there are forms which are um, particular and there are forms which kind of are more universal. So the particular form of particular would be, say, Socrates. Socrates is a particular human being, right? There's only, there was only one Socrates. After he died, there's no more Socrates. Now, what would be an example of uni universal form? Um, human being. Because we all share it, right? We're all human beings. Socrates was human being. I'm a human being. You're a human being. But what is it so special about, um, say, human beings, which distinguishes them from, say, animals? There's a particular definition you can give of a human being and um, that is why we call it universal rather than particular. Universals would always have some sort of particular definition and it would be a type of a form uh, just like a statue is type of a form, right? But um, once you create a particular statue it becomes a particular. So how do we distinguish that? How do we pick it out? Let's say, remember the picture of all the dogs which we had for um, with um, Plato's forms? And I asked you guys, what is it about them? But we say they're all dogs and um, not cats, for example. Intuition. That's how we do that. We have an intuition as human beings, and it helps us to recognize those universals. So intuition is what helps us to recognize um, those universal truths, universals within our experience. Okay. Okay. Um, That's, I guess, enough for his metaphysics and physics. Let's talk about his ethics, because his ethics are, um, I think, a better subject for especially discussion, since they do raise a lot of interesting questions. And um, again, remember, ethics um, deals with morality, with the questions of conduct. So Aristotelian ethics specifically addresses how should we behave, how, what is moral, what should we do, what should we not do. Um, he wrote several works on ethics, um, or at least we have several works which attributed to him. It's not clear whether he uh, intended them to be se several separate works or whether it's again just been edited in this way. Nonetheless, um, there is a work called um, Nicomachean Ethics, probably named after his son, Nicomachus, was the name of his son. Uh, and it is one of the most important works in ethics ever, not just for Aristotle, but for Western philosophy. It um, uh, has a different take than um, many other philosophers before and after him, uh, and it consists mainly of what we think uh, are his lecture notes. So we don't have the actual book written for publication, unlike with Plato. Plato remembered these dialogues, he meant them to be read by general public. Now, unfortunately with Aristotle, most of what we have are his lecture notes which he wrote for himself. He was given lectures um, and was making some sort of you know, brief notes and we have these notes. They survived and we can read them and they are a little cryptic. So if you read the original, does seem a little bit, um, well, a lot less interesting, let's put it this way, than Plato. Plato is, um, has dialogues, different characters, all sorts of um, stuff going on. In Aristotle, it is very, very um, dry um, prose. So for this reason, he is difficult to read. They do say he actually had some popular works too, but none of them survived. They were lost um, throughout this long period of time. Um, he was giving lectures. He was giving lectures mainly to um, young people from wealthy aristocratic families who were about to become leaders, political leaders. So that should be kept in mind. Um, he is explaining to them, first of all, what is um, a best way to live. 
Okay, let's look at the um, few things he talks about there. He makes it clear from the beginning that the goal is um, to make it preliminary to politics. Politics to him is kind of more important part. Ethics is just introducing introduction to the politics. We'll talk about his politics a little bit later today, towards the end of the class. But nonetheless, before you understand his politics, ethics are more important, and they actually were more influential. Um, now, why is politics more important? Uh, how specifically the human good is to be pursued within the city? The practical application of it to Aristotle is more important than the, you know, abstract idea of what is good. He thought that, you know, again, he is kind of bringing it down to earth, right? He criticized Plato quite a lot, even though he was his student, for just being too abstract and talking about these things which are not really helpful to us in this life. Because if you read Plato, a lot of stuff there um, can just makes you think, well, then perhaps the best life will start after I die. <laughs> uh, but um, Aristotle, of course, doesn't even really believe in life after death. Um, he never really talks that there is no life after death, but from his work, you can kind of gather that he probably does not believe in that. He thinks that we are here for a reason and we should concentrate on this life rather than some sort of uh, abstract possibility that maybe there is some other life after that. Um, so a couple of quotes from his work. Knowledge of the good seem to be the concern of the most authoritative science, the highest master science. And this is obviously the science of politics, because it lays down which of the sciences there should be in the cities and which each class of person should learn uh, and up to what level. So again, this is kind of preliminary to his politics. So he talks about three possible um, types of life we can lead as human beings. Life of pleasure, life of politics, and life of contemplation. And then he um, goes over all of them and says, uh, well, what he thinks about each one of these lives. He says, life of pleasure, well, obviously, he says, most, uh, you can say, regular folks, regular people, they choose life of pleasure. Um, what does he think about the life of pleasure? Well, um, he actually thinks that this is very um, slavish and only fit for cattle. As human beings, we can do better than that because cattle and you know animals naturally enjoy pleasure. Um, if you have a cat or a dog or whatever, you know, they know pleasure, they enjoy pleasure, physical pleasures, simple pleasures. So to him, um, striving after something like this seems completely wasteful. It seems like uh, for a human being, Striving after life of pleasure is no better than um, acting like a dog or a cat. So he uh, dismisses that as uh, the best life. Now, how about life of politics? Well, since he is actually giving these lectures to politicians, he's not very dismissive of that. He says actually politics is a, a very good goal. However, um, what specifically is um, there for us to admire. Is it honor? Is it wealth? He's saying, no, it actually doesn't seem like this is something for us to um, strive towards. Um, it doesn't seem like the final goal there because honor, for one thing, well, it depends on the opinion of other people, right? You, they may honor you, they may not honor you. Uh, it can always be taken away from you. It doesn't seem like that kind of a final goal um, for someone to have in life. Same thing with wealth. He says wealth is not bad. He's not against people having wealth, but he say that's an instrumental, right? We are getting wealth for, in order to get something else. We're not getting wealth for itself. Be it honor again, in which case that brings us back to that being um, dependent on other people, or being a pleasure, and that again brings us also back to um, the life of an animal. So he did not think that um, wealth is also a worthy goal. So what exactly is 
a, a worthy goal for a human being. Now, Pete mentions Plato actually in this work and again criticizes him and he says that, well, for one thing, Plato is wrong when he talks about the good as some sort of an absolute um, thing because the good, when we talk about things being good, um, we talk about it in all sorts of different um, ways. So all goods are different, right? Um, we can't really say that there is such thing as the good. Nonetheless, we can ask the question, what is the final goal of human life? What is worthy of the choice by itself and not instrumental to achieve something else? Um, now, let me ask you guys, what do you think? Maybe um, you know the answer or maybe you can just come up with something. What's the final goal? What do we all want? Yeah, exactly. To be happy. Happiness. Happiness is the final goal. So that's kind of an abstract but um, realistic answer. We all want to be happy. Naturally, there are different... Um, the different question is what is happiness? But um, uh, that different people can answer in a very different way. Nonetheless, the final goal is to be happy. Note that actually the Greek word he is using, and again, that's one of those situations when it's kind of difficult to talk about it in English because um, the words, the Greek words are different, is eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is an interesting word. It's tr translated typically as happiness. Nonetheless, it's not the same as English word happiness because English word happiness is a state, right? You can say, uh, I'm happy right now. And you can say, I'm not happy in the next 10 minutes. Now, eudaimonia cannot be like that. Eudaimonia is essentially a good life. It means that your life as a whole is uh, prosperous, that you are pleased with your life. So it's happiness in a broader sense. It is when you are like about to die and you can say, okay, I had such a great life. That would be the kind of happiness he uh, means when he says eudaimonia. Not um, the happiness you have when you watch a good TV show and you are enjoying it. Right? So eudaimonia, it actually has two parts. Um, you means good and daimonia um, comes from the word daemon. Right? What is daemon? It's uh, like a not a god, but kind of like a god, a good god. So essentially what uh, this word means is um, you are under patronage of a good god. So the, your life is going in such a great way that you're pleased with it. So it is kind of happiness, but um, in a much more um, general sense. So, yeah, okay. Um, another quote from the book. Happiness, therefore, does not lie in amusement, he says. Um, he makes a conclusion that, based on what we also said before, it cannot be an amusement. So what exactly is happiness? He says, it would be strange if the end were amusement, and one were to take trouble and suffer hardship all one's life in order to amuse oneself. So the point he is making is, if you look at your life as a whole, and let's say again, you are about to die, you are 80 whatever years old, uh, just because you were amused a lot in your life would not necessarily make you say, I had such a great life. There's got to be something more to it than that, right? Uh, especially since we also have all sorts of problems in life and we overcome them and we have some achievements which we are proud of and so on. And that's not exactly all amusement, right? In fact, amusement would probably play the smallest part in all that. And... Um, there are more fundamental things there. So he says, for in a word, uh, everything that we choose, we choose for the sake of something else, except happiness, which is an end. Now to exert oneself and work for the sake of amusement seems silly and utterly childish. So again, he dismisses this idea. Uh, now, to understand exactly what he thinks our happiness is and how we should live our life, we need to introduce a couple of other, well, rather, at least one more Greek word, and this is word ergon. Um, ergon. What exactly is ergon? You cannot translate it exactly in English, um, but you can explain the meaning of ergon so you guys could understand. Now, when 
In Greek, you talk about ergon of a knife, you saying that is to cut. The knife is there to cut. Now, how about ergon of a lyre player? The ergon of a lyre player is to play a lyre. So, in other words, it's some sort of characteristic activity or function of everything. So, Greeks thought that everything, including human beings, has a characteristic activity which um, he or she must perform. So then you can ask based on that, what is ergon of a human being? What is a characteristic activity of a human being? Now, characteristic activity of a knife is to cut, naturally. Characteristic activity of a hammer would be to, um, you know, hammer nails or something like that. What is characteristic activity of a human being? What do you think? Again, note that ergon or characteristic activity has to be specific to whatever it is. So, characteristic activity of a knife is to cut. Now, if you say that characteristic activity of human being is to amuse um, him or herself, no, that the problem is then you saying that indeed it's no different from an animal, no different from a cat, because they also amuse themselves. Right? So how is it characteristic to a human being? Then you just making human being put in human being on the level of a cat. Now what's characteristic about human beings though? Yeah, it's not that important. And that's the reason why, because if it was then we would be no better than cats and dogs and um, cow and you know all sorts of other animals who also amuse themselves. We would be better than, I guess, cockroaches. I don't think they amuse themselves. Although <laughs> I doubt it. But we definitely, my cat, um, he amuses himself. I'm pretty sure of that. He has fun. So if that's the um, point of life, then certainly we would be no different. But are we different? Well, some people may actually say we are not, but um, hopefully we are. And then that, that's actually what um, Aristotle means. So what, again, yeah, that's the discussion. So what is this function or characteristic activity of a human being? How are we different from animals, from other animals? Because we are an animal too, but we are a little bit different, right? At least a little bit. How? Yes, well, they have brains too, and they kind of do the thinking, but isn't there something more to our thinking than to their thinking? So it's kind of warm, but we're not quite there yet. Um, Yeah, complex thoughts, yes, that's close. Well, for one thing, we have language, right? And that definitely t distinguishes us from all other animals. There's no single animal other than us who has language. Even though sometimes I wonder if my cat does. But um, nonetheless, I doubt it. He, he um, speaks certain, he tries to say certain things, but this is mainly sounds rather than words. Um, and I doubt that they are like very meaningful. I'm sure that uh, there is certain emotion behind them, but nonetheless, um, I doubt he can like talk about philosophy and stuff like that. Whereas we can, we can talk about philosophy and we can think about philosophy. Um, so that obviously is different from all other animals, isn't it? Can you name any other animal who can um, talk and think about philosophy? I don't think so. And that is um, what is specific to us. So, um, remember another Greek word which we mentioned before, arete. Arete basically again being translated as virtue. But in this case we can put these two words together and say that if argon is a characteristic activity, arete is actually being good at 
doing that. So again, taking example of a knife, um, the argon of a knife to cut things, what is arete of a knife to cut things well? If it's a good knife, if it cut, cuts very well, we say, oh, it has arete. Say, in a similar way, you can talk about a lyre player. Um, what is ergon of a lyre player? Well, play a lyre, obviously. But what is arete? Arete is to do it well, to do it so that others would say, wow, he's such a great lyre player. So arete of a human being would be to do that characteristic activity which we have as human being and to do it well to use our rational capacity, reason, what distinguishes us from other animals, and to do it well. Um, that would be a human arete. So, again, it's usually translated as virtue. Um, that would be, I guess, the best way to translate it. So, human virtue, then, would be uh, that. But um, Aristotle also says that it's not enough to just have it, because... If somebody just has it and does absolutely nothing with it, we can't say um, he has a happy life. We can't say he is a happy person. What is needed is some sort of action. You actually have to put it to some sort of a use. So the human happiness would be an activity rather than a state. You are not in a state of happiness. You are happy when you're doing stuff and you are happy about doing that. It is human virtue to use your rational capacity, to use your reason, to apply it to stuff and to get some sort of result. That can be a variety of things. You can put it um, in terms of like, say, um, transforming things, right? To take a pile of clay and to create a pot out of them. Note that that is creative activity, right? You've done something. You can be proud of yourself. And if you've done it well, if it's a beautiful pot, and other people see it and they go, wow, that is so great, then you are happy. And that's what makes us happy as human beings. Note again that no other animal can actually do that. Even though they do have some activity too, but this is more of an instinct, instinctual activity. Even if they build a nest or something, they are not really like making plans for it and then, you know, executing it in a variety of ways. They just inst instinctively bring certain objects and put them together into a nest. Uh, we as human beings, on the other hand, can just sit there for hours and wonder, should we build a house here or there? Should it be two-story or three-story? Should it be made of wood or brick, right? That actually is something we can go through and find the best solution for ourselves and for others. And note that this is actually, again, very characteristic to a human being. So that would be a human arete. He also talks about um, uh, parts of the soul in a way similar to Plato. And um, it is very similar, but there is some difference. There is a bit of a difference. He also says that we have a rational part of the soul. In that sense, he kind of agrees with our soul and he even says that it is kind of immortal part. Um, immortal in what sense? Well, not necessarily that uh, there will be a soul surviving, right? Because this is all parts of the soul. But some part of the soul will survive and this is the rational part. How do you think rational part of the soul can survive after our death? Any idea? No. Again, note that the whole thing is the soul. Part of the soul dies. This part, vegetative, does, appetitive and desiring dies. You're not going to have any desires after you die. And you're also not going to need any food. I don't think you'll be eating too many bananas. Uh, but, rational part of the soul will survive. It will be immortal. So how is that possible? So again, note that the soul actually has several parts. Not all of them survive death. Only rational part survives. 
So any idea how that could happen? Yeah, okay, Maria absolutely right. The ideas do live on. If you write the book, the book will still be there. If you tell people something like I'm telling you guys right now, it will still be there. Uh, it may be there thousands of years after now. We read in Aristotle today who died more than 2,300 years ago. Um, so he did survive in that sense. That's what he actually means. Only this rational part, the rational part we will not undoubtedly survive. Not for everybody, but for people like Aristotle, it will. And for many of us, it will, but not for everybody. Naturally, if you never wrote anything and never left anything of value, then that probably is not going to survive very long. But even that may still have some impact, say, on your children, on those closest to you. They may still remember you for at least a while after you die. They will say, oh, remember my dad or my mom used to say this and that and how they were thinking about this and that. So that, that would be the answer. That's how he was looking at it. But nonetheless, that's not, again, the only part of the soul. The soul has two other parts, which he, one of them he called vegetative. That's similar to appetitive part uh, Plato had, but he actually distinguished vegetative from appetitive and desiring part. Why? Well, because not all our desires are about nutrition and growth. Not all our desires are to have food and sex and stuff like that. We have other desires. We have other appetite. They can be directed either towards reason or away from it. So we actually can uh, have desires to study, desires to uh, learn new things. And we can have desires to um, have sex and have other uh, more vegetative stuff. So it can be directed towards either reason or uh, vegetative stuff or whatever other stuff. And this is important to understand because he also says that in order for a human being to have virtue, um, a human being has to uh, be growing up and learning it as a child since birth. So that is not something you can just study today in class when you're like 20 years old. It's too late. Aristotle would say too late, way too late. It has to be done when you're zero, one, two, three years old, and this is a job of your parents. And if you have it, you have it. And if you don't, you're not just going to catch it like, you know, a flu or something. Um, not going to happen. In no amount of effort, because it's already too late at that point. He thought that it is really something that um, has to be learned as a child, has to be given to you by your parents, by those close to you, and then once you uh, get this disposition to be virtuous, you will be virtuous throughout your entire life. So in that sense, it is a little bit like, uh, oh, so there's nothing we can do? Well, there's a little bit we can do probably, but not that much. He thought that uh, many people are spoiled from young age and they are just being put on the wrong track and that they are kind of lost. Uh, they lost for themselves and for society. And unlike Plato, remember Plato actually thought, um, and Socrates thought, that if you explain, if you teach somebody um, about the good, then they will become good. But Aristotle thought, no, that's not going to happen. If you uh, did not get this kind of a habit since childhood, you can listen to it and your reason will hear it, but um, you will still be... Um, your disposition will be towards those base pleasures in life. It will not be towards um, the ethical uh, matters. So, yeah, old habits die hard, exactly. He would say that um, um, just understanding what the good is, is not enough, by no means. It's definitely kind of experience. He actually kind of compared it to um, riding a bicycle. So what is the purpose of human life? Again, another quote from him. He says, We take this kind of life to be activity of the soul and actions in accordance with reason. So whatever you do in life being driven by reason rather than by um, your emotions or um, um, desires. And your desires should follow reason too. Characteristic activity of the good person, ergon of a good person, 
to be to carry this out well and nobly and a characteristic activity to be accomplished well when it is accomplished in accordance with appropriate virtue then if this is so the human good turns out to be activity of the soul in accordance with virtue um, so that's why we actually call it virtue ethics note that um, it especially is interesting for us today because it is rather atheistic approach he is not really making um, um, God part of it God is really not playing any role here what he is actually saying and that's why this approach became quite popular especially in the last 100 200 years uh, when people kind of rediscovered um, this part of Aristotle and thought what actually is not bad is that you will actually be happy about your life if you feel like you've done well as a human being uh, regardless of whether there is some sort of reward for you after that in fact he thought that's actually a very rotten idea uh, that you will only be rewarded after your death if there is some sort of afterlife it actually kind of spoils human beings and most of them are still not able to really believe that and not able to really pursue it in this way most human beings he thought um, actually want the reward right here in this life while we are still around it's just that um, they are again misdirected in many ways or even if they understand that you have to do uh, these virtuous actions why do we need God? Well, Aristotle would uh, probably say we don't really. We don't need God. Um, we sh have every right to uh, believe in God because he himself, remember, he's saying there is this unmoved mover based on what we see around us. But uh, what does it mean to need God? You know, it, 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 you can look at it in this way. If there is God, it doesn't matter whether you need him or not he is there and if there is no god then it also doesn't matter whether you, you need him or not so it's not like you're going to construct god um, in order to believe in him he either is there or he is not so naturally again he would say it's not that we need god um, but we have to make um, sure that we live good life for ourselves regardless of that it's just something which will make us happy and we all want to be happy don't we who doesn't want to be happy uh, so virtue itself or arete is a state of character it is something that you kind of um, either are or are not a morally good person is not simply the one who performs these good actions he would say that actually is someone who enjoys them uh, that's why it has to be instilled into people from childhood after they're born because that's like um, one of these things which you know again becomes your habit and then you will delight in them just for their own sake he said delight uh, a good person delights in virtuous actions and is vexed at vicious ones as a music musical man enjoys beautiful tunes but is pained by the bad ones so that's a very good comparison for a virtuous person to uh, not only do a bad deed but see a bad deed being done by somebody else is like for a musician to hear a, uh, to hear this really bad tune like if you are a musician or even not a musician and then somebody plays a piano but really badly or violin and there's like really horrible sounds coming out and you go ah, please stop that's how virtuous person would be about these bad actions and again because it is just part of their nature to uh, like good things and to think that they are uh, good and to not um, like bad things and he thinks that since childhood the children can actually be taught that because when they are born they can go either way um, there's no such thing as the person who are born virtuous nobody is born virtuous nobody is born vicious uh, we become virtuous and vicious based on uh, how we grow up now of course there may be some natural predisposition today we can say you know looking at dna uh, but you still you can't say that there are people whose dna is so that they fundamentally bad and vicious right it still has something to do with the environment they grow up in and they can still be uh, 
better people and they can still be worse people and if you look at any criminals vicious people you can always find this stuff in their childhood whatever it may be um, the alcoholic parents um, bad surroundings and so on which a actually had an effect on them uh, sometimes it's difficult sometimes you can see somebody coming from a very good family and still becoming um, this horrible person but there still has to be something there maybe this good family still did not uh, do good job teaching them these good values uh, maybe the family itself was like very nice but they just didn't do um, the correct uh, didn't take the correct approach towards how they teach their children okay um, yeah so this is something like uh, riding a bicycle you have to learn it it's not something which you can explain to somebody if you want to teach somebody to ride a bicycle and you just want to be talking about it you may be talking for two hours and explain everything and the person will just get on a bicycle and immediately fall down because unless they have experience doing that um, that's not going to help any. Um, why should we be virtuous again looking at it from purely atheistic point of view um, well that the simple answer is that even though we may get some sort of um, satisfaction from vicious action from bad actions it just pays better to be virtuous in the end of the day you will have a better life and um, many people can attest to that it's just better prospect than being happy it's not that you cannot be happy by being a bad person but you have much better chances of being happy as a good person um, now another important part of his um, virtue ethics is this idea of a mean he's saying that um, in particular um, what it is to be virtuous in each situation is to find um, the kind of the correct uh, course of action which is not too much and not too little of something so um, not an excess and not a um, uh, a lack so for example he would say that uh, if you look at activities such as confidence in danger confidence in face in danger uh, you can have excess of that and that would be rashness if somebody is too confident in facing danger they are not um, courageous they are rash but you can also have too little and that would be cowardice note that he thought virtue would be courage and that is like a mean that's actually the this perfect spot when it's not too rash not too um, cowardly but um, just the right amount same thing is enjoying pleasure you can enjoy pleasure but if you enjoy pleasure too much that would be self-indulgence if you enjoy it too little you can actually enjoy it too little too that would be being puritanical uh, but you can enjoy pleasure in the right amount and that would be temperance temperate person enjoys pleasure but does not make pleasure the most important thing in life he never said that you should not enjoy it at all in moderation um, same thing with giving money if somebody gives too much money uh, it's vulgarity that is um, not very good but um, if somebody doesn't give any money to uh, anyone to poor or whatever that would be stinginess and there is a golden mean there too and that is generosity you should be generous not too much not too little truth telling if you take to tell too much truth about yourself that is being boastful that's actually not very good but on in the same time if you don't then that is self-depreciation if you are too modest about yourself never even give yourself any credit so self-honesty that's the way to go so note that in all these cases there is a mean of course he mentions that in some cases there's no such thing as the uh, you know the correct uh, moderate amount such as murder adultery you can say that there is like the correct amount of murder not too much more murder not too little no that there are some things which you just should not do period but in most other things there is this kind of a golden mean that uh, correct amount and he says it's not an arithmetical mean it's not like you can just divide it into half and the middle point will be the right right amount so what is this correct amount you have to actually again learn throughout life and understand because it depends on the circumstances 
there is always some sort of a correct amount but that's one of the um, skills which virtuous person has um, in each situation to figure out what is this correct amount what does this mean um, which is um, there but you have to know it. so just in summary again um, what is the virtuous person according to Aristotle it is the person who carefully follows reason reason is the key word here it's very important who desires the right thing in right situations um, has well-formed character knows the proper goals in human life um, can estimate how to achieve those goals and the one who has most experience in making tough moral decisions so that would be morally good person according to Aristotle the person who is has best chances of being happy and again you can only get it through upbringing from your childhood which is why his uh, politics is so important because his politics uh, his work on politics actually talks about how do we achieve it as a society why it is so important um, note that he also mentions there though um, in the end of this work that the best form of life for a human being would be a life of contemplation why well that actually is something which again unmoved mover God does and the closer we are to God the better we are we are the only animals who can actually achieve that but he is um, conscious of the fact that it's not um, suitable for most human beings however the human beings for wh whom it is uh, accessible and they would be not surprisingly philosophers um, that is the happiest human beings because the life of philosophy the life of contemplation is the life of God remember God um, unmoved mover doesn't actually do anything he thinks and he thinking about thinking is his sole activity so the closer you can get to that and you can never quite get there completely because unlike God we have bodies uh, and we have life which we need to live but the closer you are to that the happier you would be so um, life of contemplation is the best life for a human but not everyone can and even should probably um, strive at that it's too high of a goal um, well let's talk a little bit more about this so what do you personally think happiness is in life do you uh, think there is such thing as a best form of life achieving career growth okay that that actually is rather close to uh, what Aristotle says uh, in a sense because uh, personal achievement that definitely is important part of it right we are as human beings have to achieve some things that's why a life of pure pleasure would not be a good life because what exactly does it achieve uh, eating the most amount of tasty things having the most sex with most um, I don't know men or women or whatever um, it is you are <laughs> enjoying to have sex with seems like that is kind of a silly goal isn't it um, right so okay yeah um, bright stories so close graduate so again kind of some sort of fulfillment know that reason actually definitely has part of big part of it right in stories uh, how many animals can do that only human beings that is a very human thing and you are using your reason there right uh, same with suing clothes I never seen my cat um, sue anything <laughs> so that that's a very human thing to do you are creating something with your hands um, graduate well yeah so what would be then the best form of life like in the end of the day if you again 85 years old what would you say uh, was a good life if you w what would make you happy in that sense well uh, okay with pursuing success um, that that's the whole question what would you consider success note that if you um, um, such as Abba uh, want to write stories so close and graduate then success would be defined in these terms you can say okay I have written really really good stories which I'm proud of uh, and other people like them 
I have soon fantastic clothes, which again, um, I really loved doing that, and other people loved um, the results. And I also graduated, and other people um, thought that I did it very well too. So note that this is very, very um, um, realistic type of success. But if you are, for example, setting yourself some other goals, such as, well, note that this is the idea of wealth, right? Um, if you look at wealth uh, and try to make it as a goal in life, would you be like very pleased with yourself if you die and say, okay, I at this point I have a billion dollars in my big bank account. But that doesn't seem to make very much sense because like, okay, um, you may be proud about, you know, uh, creating this business empire or whatever it is you did to achieve that. But suppose you won it in a lottery and all you did is just deposit it in a bank. Would you really be proud of that? Would you be like dying and saying, hey, I did absolutely nothing and I still got a billion dollars, which I never even spent. Um, quite an achievement. It seems stupid, isn't it? It makes no sense whatsoever. So that, again, that's not the money. Um, there's nothing wrong with having money. But the question here is, how did you achieve this money? What did you do? Um, are you proud of what you did? Now that is what um, is fundamental. The money itself is secondary. And Aristotle is not saying money are necessary, but he's saying they are instrumental to other things. Other things are important. Money are not important. Money is just kind of a, a tool to maybe achieve these other things, to build this business empire, to create those um, jobs or whatever for other people to be proud of yourself. Now that is an achievement. Money, that's nothing. That's just a pile of um, paper. Well, that is a little circular. Tr happiness is truly genuine. Uh, what does it mean? Um, like, again, you have to put it in a more concrete terms. Um, what is the difference between genuine and not genuine happiness? If somebody says when they are dying, I am happy, well, we will take them for their word. They probably are happy. But as long as they are honest, right? And note that this is, of course, a um, like very important question for all of us. Because we all live in this life. So we all want to know, why are we doing that? What would make us happy? And many people are just never think about that and they never really care about that. Um, they just go on living. And we as philosophers, we do actually care. We, that, that's why we're asking these questions. Now let's talk a little bit about his politics. Because like I said, he actually thinks that the instrumental uh, ethics is instrumental to politics. Politics are more important. Why is it more important? Um, it builds on ethics and it actually tells us how should we live as a society. Our purpose is to consider what form of political community is best of all those uh, who, are, uh, who are most able to realize their ideal of life. So in order for us to achieve all these goals, we need to do what? Cooperate with other people. It's impossible to achieve any of your life goals without other people. It's interesting to me that sometimes people don't realize that, but any goal you have in life only is achievable through other people and it also only makes sense in the eyes of other people, like as long as other people do that. So if you're writing stories, are you writing it for yourself? That would be a rather miserable way to do it. And I doubt it would ever make you happy if nobody ever reads them, right? You are writing them and burning them or something and nobody sees them. Um, same thing with clothes, same thing with anything else. Um, you want other people to see that, you want other people to, um, yeah, you want to publish, it's, it's normal. It, that's actually what we measure our success is. And for this, we need what? Society. We need to have a connection to these other people. And that's what politics is about. Um, so he kind of goes through um, history of humankind a little bit there, talking about how at first, um, the first form of civilization human beings had was a household, right? Household. Um, even the prehistoric people who lived in caves had some sort of family. They had some sort of children. Um, they probably didn't have a wife, but they had partner of some sort 
um, maybe multiple partners who they were with and that kind of made them all related and um, that's what the first um, small uh, association of human beings was then they started um, bunching together into some sort of villages several households right maybe they are still even related but not as closely and they live together and then he says the next stage was a state police um, that's when they formed something even bigger and that is um, to Aristotle the most important actually the state to Aristotle it exists for the sake of good life uh, in the end it is the best um, form of cooperation man by nature Aristotle says is a political animal the man has to live with other people without other people we are literally nothing and you can again test it by just thinking what would happen if all other human beings disappeared and you are the only one left and at first you may be excited thinking oh I could just you know go to uh, all the stores and get all these goods and but then when you um, really like think about it two three four days later you'll get bored to death even if you're not going to um, literally die because food will get spoiled since there will be no electricity and stuff but uh, even if you survive on bananas or whatever uh, what would you be doing there won't be any internet because there's, there's no other human beings there won't be any TV because there's no other human beings um, your life will become completely pointless um, after a few days you'll be completely bored and within a year you may even kill yourself or at least you'll be so bored that you will think I may as well kill myself because everything we do again is related to these other people around us family first of all remember how important family is well I guess what this is other people um, and of course um, other people other than family they also are very important this is how you can achieve the happy life the eudaimonia uh, by associating yourself with other people in a correct way so these other people would value you and think what you're doing is valuable and praise you and be uh, appreciative of what you're doing starting with your family but not just limiting to your family so a city state or a polis is not sharing a common location according to Aristotle it's not just a bunch of people who live in the same place it doesn't exist for the purpose of preventing mutual wrongdoing and ex exchanging goods either that would be too simplistic like many people look at it like well we kind of don't want to be with other people but we have to because otherwise um, um, you know we may need to uh, say have other goods which we can't ourselves make say shoes and stuff I can't make shoes other people make shoes I can make some other stuff and exchange it for shoes so that's kind of a again a very uh, typical way to look at this but Aristotle think no you should take it one step up um, he says rather while this must be present if indeed there is to be a city it's necessary naturally when all of them are present there is still not yet a city state but only when households and families live well as a community whose end is complete and self-sufficient life so you actually have to realize that you need all these people and these other people have to realize that they need you and only all of them together can achieve something can achieve these amazing things which we did achieve fly into outer space put a man on the moon uh, produce all these amazing goods all these cars all these airplanes all this other stuff how did we achieve all that well certainly it wasn't one guy sitting at home uh, all day who created that you need other people to do that and only in cooperation with these other people you can achieve all that so do you agree or disagree with that what do you guys think can we happy life can we have a happy life outside of the state by ourselves know that in this country there is a lot of like a suspicion about the state the government and so on so in that sense America is very different from even say European tradition in Europe um, there's a lot more understanding of the role of the state again in order for people to have a happy life whereas here it seems like the, they say um, the government which governs least governs best and so on it's like 
it's looked at as some sort of necessary evil. It is evil, but, oh, well, we kind of have to have it. Note that Aristotle definitely rejects that. When we will talk about Hegel and Marx, we will see uh, how they actually build on that and how their ideas are closely related to Aristotle's ideas. Aristotle was, of course, the first one we know of who actually said all these things. Yeah, like if you really think about it, um, you really can't have a happy life outside of the state. You can't have any life outside of the state, really. Um, Aristotle said, um, fam another famous thing there, that uh, you have to be either a, a god or a beast to live outside of the state. And he's kind of right. So if you're a god, then I suppose you don't need a state. And if you're a beast, uh, an animal, then again, you don't need a state. But if you are a human being, that is natural for you to have a state and to be related to all these other people. Well, select few. I would say that this is psychopaths. <laughs> There's some sort of psychopathology if you really can survive and live outside of state and still be um, somehow satisfied and happy. Perhaps um, there, there are people like this, but that, that, that's not very normal. Because again, note that all these goals you are talking about, they are so closely related to other people that uh, without them, none of it really makes any kind of sense. Um, you may um, think to yourself, oh, I don't need all these other people, but you really do. You really do. And um, it's best if you realize that. Now, there's a of course, more uh, complicated question of whether sh the state should be before family and individual. Because for most people, family and individual come first and the state comes second. But that's not what Aristotle is saying. And the reason he's saying that the state is more important is because he's saying the state is uh, a lot of people. The state is much bigger. So it's kind of the interests of the state should come before uh, the interest of the individual, because one individual um, doesn't matter as much as, let's say, a million individuals. A million individuals, each one of them is an individual, but there's hell a lot more of them. So if there is some sort of a clash between an interest of one individual and an interest of million of them, the interests of million are more important. Which, of course, doesn't mean that, you know, you should completely forget about this one because a million of individuals is still a million of individuals, right? But nonetheless, uh, the priority goes to the state. And um, that's something among, uh, about which there is a lot of disagreement um, in politics today and in philosophy and so on. Not all philosophers necessarily agree with that. Okay, just briefly, because we are pretty much out of time, he was going over different types of state, um, and he was saying that um, any type of state can be either good or bad. So monarchy, he was saying monarchy could be good and then it is kind of a kingly. Uh, but if it's tyranny, then it is bad. Uh, there can be a rule of the few people and that could be also good. And it's um, what he called aristocracy. If there is few good people, kind of like the um, Plato's Republic. But it can also be bad if it's an oligarchy. If there is a few rich people who are only doing it for their own interest. And the same thing with the rule of the many. Um, note that he actually used the word democracy again in a negative way. He was saying it is bad. Uh, but he was saying a good rule of the many is politeia. Why is he saying democracy is bad? Because he actually means it in a different way than we do. Um, he was saying democracy um, how is it different from politeia? In democracy, poor people uh, do everything in their own interest. In other words, they do not take into consideration the interest of the rich people, for example. How is politeia different? In politeia, everyone's interest is important. So it's not just the interest of the poor, but also the interest of the rich, the interest of the middle class, and so on. Everyone's interest should be um, served, and then it is a good uh, democracy. But if it is um, only for the interest of the poor, he thought that is also not good, because in that case, um, you will create a very bad state. And he was very critical of Plato, too. He thought that this whole idea of communism, pla platonic idea, remember, abolishing private property, having this common households, uh, he thought that's stupid. If 
you um, take away all the children from their parents as soon as they're born, uh, he thought that actually will, instead of like you thinking of all the children as your children, you'll think of none of these children as your children. That actually will completely negate this idea of a family. So that's why we value our family, because we know this is actually our children. And he thought that is still fundamental. So he is a lot more realistic about that than Plato was. Okay, I guess that's all the time we have for today. So just briefly, um, remember, for Monday, please read chapter 7. We will go into the Stoics, Epictetus and um, Marcus Aurelius. And make sure you do the homework and quiz for chapter 6 for Aristotle. Other than that, we are done for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And next week we will talk about um, the Stoics both times. And then after that, there is a test. Uh, the first test is coming up. So make sure you are preparing for it because the review is already there. Okay, have a great um, weekend and I'll see you on Monday.